Welcome everyone to this Autism Awareness Month special event sponsored by the National Institute of Mental Health and OARC, the Office of Autism Research Coordination within NIMH. I'm Dr. Susan Daniels, the Acting National Autism Coordinator, the Director of OARC, and the Executive Secretary of the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee. April is Autism Awareness Month, where we promote the acceptance, inclusion, and empowerment of all people on the autism spectrum and renew our commitment to supporting autistic individuals and their families. During this month, our office annually hosts a special event to highlight the unique contributions that autistic people make to our communities and society. This year, we're excited to put the spotlight on the ways autistic people are contributing their creative energy to the visual arts around our country and around the world. Our program today is titled a Portrait of Autism, Artists and Their Works. And we'll be featuring artists Jeremy Cecile Kira, Ronaldo Bird, Sheila Benedis, and David Downs. They each work in unique styles of art and will be sharing parts of their journey with autism and their art with us. Our program will include individual and group interviews with the artists, as well as the chance to see their art. As you watch the presentation, please feel free to submit questions you may have to the artists during, using the live feedback link that you can see in the lower left side of the NIH videocast window. In the last segment of the event, we'll have some time to share audience questions with our guests. I'd like to acknowledge Ms. Jalen Prince, President and Chair of the Madison House Autism Foundation for her help in the initial conception of this event. Madison House has had an Arts for Autism program for many years in which they showcase the work of autistic artists at, each, at special events each year. Dr. Joshua Gordon, the director of NIMH and the chair of the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee wasn't be able to be with us today live, but he pre-recorded a message for you all. And I'd like to share that message with you now. Welcome to the National Institute of Mental Health and Office of Autism Research Coordination special event for Autism Awareness Month. I'm Dr. Joshua Gordon, director of the NIMH, and chair of the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee, or IACC. Thanks to everyone for joining us today for this event. I wanna thank also Dr. Susan Daniels and the Office of Autism Research Coordination here at NIMH for its tremendous organization. I'd like to extend a special welcome to our four featured artists today, Sheila Benedis, Ronaldo Bird, David Downs, and Jeremy Cecile Kira. I have had a chance to peruse their wonderful artwork and I'm inspired by the beautiful, colorful drawings, book covers, baskets, paintings, and all the myriad ways that each of you use art to tell the world about yourselves, your environment, and your experiences. The four of you display a range of abilities and disabilities experienced by autistic pe people, and I am glad to have the opportunity to showcase such a diverse group of individuals for Autism Awareness Month. One of the reasons that NIMH holds this special event each year is to highlight the strengths and talents of autistic people. A substantial part of my job as the chair of the IACC is hearing about the very real challenges faced by autistic individuals and their families and communities and working with our federal partners to address those challenges. But it's also wonderful to take a moment to recognize that the lives of autistic people are not all about those challenges. We know that many autistic people also display unique strengths talents and creative abilities that also deserve our attention. For that reason, we use this special event during Autism Awareness Month to highlight the array of strengths and abilities many of these individuals have, as well as the challenges that shape those experiences. The White House has also emphasized the importance of recognizing autistic individuals, their family members and other caregivers in his proclamation honoring World Autism Awareness Day, President Biden has reconfirmed his commitment to ensuring equity and inclusion for all individuals 
in communities, workplaces, and schools. The IACC is also committed to this goal, and the forthcoming IAC strategic plan describes recent progress in the area of equity and inclusion, as well as opportunities for growth and innovation. We at NIMH continue to fund research that seeks to understand the biology of autism, develop and improve interventions, increase the effectiveness and efficiency of services for autistic individuals, and the equity with which these services are offered and accessible. It is our hope that this research will have measurable positive impacts on the lives of autistic individuals and their families in the near and long term. Again, I'd like to welcome you all. Thank you for participating in this event. I'm sorry that I'm unable to attend live, but I look forward to watching the recording of the event that will be posted in a few days on the IACC website. I encourage all of you to visit iacc.hhs.gov for more information about this and other events for Autism Awareness Month. You can also visit nimh.gov to learn more about mental health research and resources. Thank you. Well, I echo Dr. Gordon's sentiments, and we're honored today to have the opportunity to spotlight the contributions of autistic individuals to the arts in today's program and to learn more about the lives and creations of our guests. So at this time, I'd like to share with you a short video introduction to our artists, which we will play now. My name is Jeremy Cecile Kira. I am a visionary artist. I paint my dreams. When I dream, I am processing what I have seen and heard when I am awake. Then I paint the painting for my dream and write a description of what I see and what it means. I have the gift of synesthesia, which means I see emotion as color, and voices and sound elicit color as well. Before I learned to type to communicate, I frankly lived in darkness. Gradually over time my mother and others taught me. Then I realized I had the ability to learn, and that I had gifts that were hidden until I was able to show others what I was capable of. For four months I did not have access to an art studio due to the coronavirus restrictions. Frankly, I had so many dreams about what we all were living through that I learned how to translate my visions via digital art on my iPad. Now I have a small art studio at the family home and can enjoy painting with real paint once again. I'm once again painting portraits of clients and memorial art of loved ones who have died. I'm grateful to be back painting with acrylic in an art studio, and look forward to meeting you again in person. Feel free to reach me for more information via my website at jeremysvision.com, or message me via Instagram at jeremysvision. Meanwhile, stay well and stay connected. in and welcome to my gallery. I am an artist who just happens to be on the autistic spectrum. My artwork focuses on the fact that everyone is beautiful. There is beauty in everything I see and everyone has something to offer. My hope is that the world can see beauty and acceptance through my eyes. And by the way, I have three, over 300 characters that I developed. Now that you see my gallery and a little bit of how I create, I want to thank you for coming and I'll see you again soon at Ronaldo's Art Corner. Sheila Benedis, and I live in Sleepy Hollow, New York. I found out about artist books, and that's what I'm really specializing in right now. 
I'm an upbeat person and I want to raise positive energy and a peaceful feeling and convey it to the world. I found out recently that Asperger's, which I have, has many strengths. Having Asperger's can be a positive thing as well. I live next to a beautiful Rockefeller Park and I go walking there practically every day. I find that that seeing nature and walking in the woods really inspires me to do my work. I'm always working. I, I work every day. Uh, art was my road to freedom. And what I say is that I'm wabi-sabi, which means I'm perfectly imperfect or imperfectly perfect. I'm David Downs, and I'm an artist. I was drawing before I could talk, before I could communicate. Because of my autism, although I wasn't aware I had high-functioning autism, I struggled a lot at school with, with learning. But my drawings are unusual because they're all in perspective, and they look very, very different to what other, other children draw. So I always wanted to be an artist. It was about getting the academic qualifications to get into art school was a problem. Remembering facts and being able to sit exams, in fact, in the end, I did get into art school. The teachers, the art teachers, recognised something in my work. I got a diagnosis at 32, but I think I started to realise that I was on the spectrum in my late 20s. But there wasn't really as much information about autism then, like there is now. So I was just seen as different, eccentric and different. It was a huge relief, but then I went around telling everybody that I was autistic, which is a very autistic thing to do. And more and more people start understanding autism, understanding me and what it's all about, and it does make it easier. Well, what a beautiful introduction to our guests. So now I'll take the opportunity to introduce you to our guests. So if our guests would all like to turn on their cameras, I'd like to introduce Jeremy Cecile Kira, Ronaldo Bird, Sheila Benedis, and David Downs. And you're going to get a chance to hear from each of them a little later. But for now, um, we will turn on cameras and let everyone at least wave hello. And we're so excited to hear from you all today and look forward to learning more about your lives and your work. So I'm going to start with giving each person a chance to share with us. And I'm going to start with Jeremy Cecile Kira. So Jeremy, please introduce yourself and can you tell us what it was like growing up autistic with your gifts and challenges? Do you want to go up? Okay, I'll do it for you then. Four. For example, when I looked at people's faces, their facial features were all mixed up. One second, please. No problem. Sometimes uh, these um, speaking um, apps have a way of getting ahead of you. So here we go. Hello, Susan. Thanks for the invitation to be here today. I hope you don't mind if I move around during our talk. I have a hard time sitting still. Greatly I believe that as a child I saw the world differently than most people, but I did not realize why until I was an adult. Frankly, when I was a little boy living in Paris, France, I needed physical therapy to learn to move my muscles and to walk. I had sensory and vision processing challenges that made it difficult to see and to understand the world around me. For example, when I looked at people's faces, their facial features were all mixed up, like a portrait painted by Picasso. I couldn't see their emotion as an image of expression on their faces. 
but keenly I saw color around them. Greatly over the years I have had vision therapy and sensory integration therapy which helped me to process better what I am seeing. This part of my autism still impacts me today. It's what makes it difficult for me to transition from one place to another. Yet, having these differences has also been the most important aspect of my life as an artist. So Jeremy, how did you discover your gift and become an artist? I learned to communicate. I was able to explain all that I was seeing and feeling. Frankly, I found my voice only when I was a teenager in San Diego. I learned to point to letters by Soma through RPM, my mother, and then by my teachers. About 12 years ago after graduating from high school I began to communicate to others about the colors that I saw around people, and when I was listening to music. Sharing this information with others is how I learned I had the gift of synesthesia. Synesthesia is a neurological condition in which a stimulation of one sense leads to an involuntary experience in another sense. One day, I began to dictate to support staff the descriptions of the portraits I was painting every night in my dreams. Every night I dreamt I was painting beautiful abstract paintings, based on the emotional colors of the people I had seen that day. Then, one night I had different dream. I had a dream that I painted 10 of my paintings and had my own art show. I asked my mom how I could make this dream come true. Frankly mom told me I needed to learn to paint in real life. Truly it was hard at first, but I was surprised to see that with a lot of practice and the help of some teachers, I could paint the portraits I saw in my dreams. I began to paint in 2012. And in 2016 my dream of an art show came true. I had a curated solo art show and it was a big success. Soon, more people were asking me to paint their portraits. Well, I can see why it was a big success, Jeremy. What is your life like now as an artist? I imagined nicely that my life would be lonely until I realized that with my great gift of synesthesia, I could help others. Now I meet people and couples and paint their positive colors into beautiful abstract paintings. Happy people are easy to paint, but sometimes clients have terrible ideas about themselves, low confidence in their abilities. But I ask them to talk about themselves and I can see their positive attributes. Frankly, by painting their positive colors, I provide them with a reminder they can look at every day. Currently, I have paintings hanging in public places, such as the Children's Hospital in Massachusetts and various schools and colleges in California. My next project is a virtual art lesson I'll be giving through the Guggenheim Museum for their Guggenheim for All program. And frankly, I want to continue art lessons to learn new techniques. Dearly, I hope to be able to continue to help others with my gift. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy. That's so exciting. And now I'd like to hear from Ronaldo. Ronaldo. And I'll give you a minute to get on. And thank you, Jeremy, for sharing with us and Chantal for being with Jeremy. So, Ronaldo, great to see you. Great to see you. I'd, thank you. I'd love to hear a little bit about your journey with art and autism. Hello, everybody. My name is Ronaldo Berg, and I am an artist who just happens to be on the autistic spectrum. I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. And now I live in Burlington, New Jersey with my mom and my three siblings. My mom, I began painting at the age of three. My mom noticed that I was very good at art before then. I just knew 
that I was passionate about drawing and painting, and that I wanted to do, do it all day, every day. I work in my gallery, which is in my house, and it is filled with thousands of my artworks. Autism was not a household word. When I was young, but I knew that I was a different. My mom calls it special. Growing up with both gifts and challenges was both fun and difficult. It was fun because I knew that I was an artist at a very young age. And I would, I focused that while working on the challenges that I faced every day, my journey to my present work in art has been very enjoyable because I love what I am doing and I look forward to doing it every single day. Wonderful, Ronaldo. And can I ask you a quick question about some of these um, pieces that are scrolling on our screen here? With the ones with the American flag behind them with the individuals, can you tell us a little bit about what those are? This, oh, this is the President Biden. This is the Vice, the vice President Kamala Harris. and the first lady, Joe Biden, and President Barack Obama. What inspired you to paint them? Pandemic. The pandemic. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. And now I'm going to give Sheila a chance to share with us so Sheila, can you tell us something about your experience as an, as an autistic person and as an artist? Oh, you're, you're on mute. I'm Sheila Benedis. And I live and work in Sleepy Hollow, New York, which is about the Hudson, which is on the Hudson River, about north of New York City. I didn't learn I was autistic until 2009. And at 73 years old, I was diagnosed as having Asperger's. As an adult, I got no help with the autism. Growing up, I had the challenges of social interaction. I learned social skills through trial and error. I had difficulty making eye contact. I was jumping into conversations. I would make friends, but I lost them and therefore became anxious. I had sensory sensitivity. I had, my parents gave me little exposure to art. Fortunately, I also had the strengths of Asperger's. I have high intelligence, good verbal skills, ability to absorb large amounts of information, I'm self-motivated and an independent learner. I excelled in school, had a serious interest in social justice. I was left brain oriented and majored in math in college. When I graduated, it was at the inception of the computer industry, 
and I worked for several years as a programmer analyst. I didn't discover I was artistic until after my son was born. I had a friend who was a music teacher and she was teaching basketry to Japanese ladies. She asked me to take over her group. They wanted to continue learning to make more baskets. So I had to find, I had to learn how to do it. And in this process, I was inspired to make baskets as an art form. The baskets became sculptures and they were exhibited in galleries throughout the country. My husband was very supportive and one of the things he helped me with was to pack up the baskets so I could ship them by UPS. Um, I, have, I have no degrees in art, but through the strengths of Asperger's, I developed artistic knowledge and ability. However, weaving baskets um, became very tedious. And so I moved on to making installation pieces, which were exhibited. In, oh, the installation pieces were made with handmade paper and found objects incorporated into the pieces. And they were exhibited in galleries and art centers. When I started going on artist residencies, I found that artist books were the perfect thing to make because I could pack them in a suitcase to take them home at the end of the residency. Now, paper is my medium. I make artist books and paper sculptures. And I'm inspired by nature. I walk in the park every day And also I've been, oh, early in my career, I, I had a, I found a mentor who really encouraged me to do art seriously. And I love the work of Gaudi, the architect, and Matisse, Matisse's cutout. And I have the ability to think in visual images. Fantastic. Is, is there more that you want to tell us, Sheila? That well, was... I do have a special project that I'm, I'm working with now. I use epsemic writing which has no specific semantic content. It's calligraphic language with sinuous shapes. A poem is repeated compulsively to render it partially illegible. The words of a poem crawl in, crawl out, go round and round. Inside becomes outside twisting, turning road of life. This bypasses meaning and unlocks the power of the illegible. The viewer fills in his own interpretation. 
Wow, well, incredible work. Thank you, Sheila. And now I will take a moment to talk with David. So David, can you tell us about your journey with art and autism? I'm from, from a rainy England. Hello, everyone. Um, blimey, where do I start? Well, I guess I started drawing um, before I could talk. <laughs> before I could, well, certainly I could walk, before I could talk, certainly. And about around about the age of three or four, I could draw things in perspective from unusual positions. I could draw from memory, which was unusual. And my mum, my mum was very supportive. I think she noticed my ability before anyone else did. And it was, yeah, it was a, it was a interesting, challenging journey. Of course, way back in the 70s, there wasn't the, the knowledge of autism a neurological dysfunction or neurological that there is now and so it was it was a very very interesting time i think my art was a way of communicating before i could uh, talk or even write my way was to draw you know paintings draw, uh, drawing churches and and scenery and that kind of thing of skies i was very very interested in the weather and so that's what i was doing for for a very very long time all the way through primary school i had difficulties academically learning, absor absorbing inf uh, information that I wasn't particularly interested in. Um, so I did struggle a lot at primary school. I did have friends, um, and some of them, indeed, I've kept uh, some of the friends, but it was, it, was, it was challenging socially, like what I hear from the other artists as well, and social integration. And also with my art was, was, was a language and a way of communicating. What I found was I need, you know, you need to get have more than that to progress you know, in the world, so socially and at school and in, you know, family and relationships and, and it, you know, and it wasn't really until I got to art school in the, in the late 80s, at Ipswich, so I started to you know, develop you know, social skills and started making more friends as well and, and was all the time developing my art and having the awareness that, that my art could, you know, move in different directions and my life could move in different directions. And so, you know, all the way to my twenties, I eventually got into the Royal College of Art, um, and I got into the Royal College basically uh, by doing artwork about my struggle. Um, I wasn't aware at that point that I had autism or Asperger's syndrome at that point in my life, but I started doing artwork about what it was like to be different. You know, I guess we were all different to a certain extent, but I felt very different, and it was that struggle to fit in. And be part of you know this is mainstream society if that's the right way of putting it i had very supportive parents particularly my mum and my older sister as well very supportive and you know it, and i got into the royal college of art on that on that basis of, of doing artwork about about my art called disorder development so the royal college was a an adventure um it's good yeah, good fun as well um two years there and, and then leaving the royal college was where it all where the challenges really began because ultimately, being at art school, I was almost in institutionalised in a way. So I've gone from primary school to high school to sixth form, and then on to the art schools to the big wide world. And that's when the challenges for me really began. It was obviously trying to make a living out of my art in London, in, in England at that time, in the, in the mid-90s. And even then, there wasn't really the awareness of autism and the support or the understanding that there is now. And the stigma, which I'm very relieved about and, 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 and very happy about, that the stigma about autism is going. And there's a lot, and the, the positive aspects of autism and of, you know, is very important. And it's coming through in society now. So it's a big struggle after I left the Royal College. Then I got into my first serious relationship at the end of the 90s with another artist. That ended, and that was a very difficult time. But I learned an awful lot about myself. Then I realised, look, I think I might have autism. I spoke to my parents about it at length and close friends and got a diagnosis in, in 2002. So I was uh, 32 years of age. And it was, it was incredible. It was a light bulb moment. I like that term, light bulb moment. It was incredible because I was then able to understand what, what had gone on in the past, all my struggles with, with my work, with making a living, with what my new thing, which is executive function, which is obviously, you know, surviving, paying, paying my bills, being independent. And it was massive. And I think, of, you know, things have got a lot better in the context of understanding things. 
So all the way through from probably the noughties, I was just doing more and more exhibitions, getting more success, selling my work, more, I think, emotionally independent. And in 2014, I met Rachel, my other half, and then we lived in America, which is incredible, three years, in uh, California, and now I'm a dad, Natalia, and she's two and a half years old. It's incredible. And I've got to mention our dog, Winston, as well. Excellent. Well, thank you for that fantastic summary, David. And as I've been watching the art scroll by, I want to dive into some of these pieces, such fascinating places and so beautiful. So now I'm going to take uh, time to ask the group some questions. And I'll ask questions that anyone from our artist group here can answer. And you don't have to answer every question if you don't want to, but we would love to hear your perspectives on various ones of you. So I'll give you all a moment to get on the screen so we can start with those. But yes, everyone's introductory story was fascinating and we look forward to hearing even more. Okay, so we are all on now. So my first question is, um, can several of you or all of you tell me a little bit about your artistic style and how that's evolved? And if you wanna to indicate to me with a raised hand or something when you're ready that you'd like to answer, go ahead, David. And oh, you're on mute. I'm, I'm not on mute anymore. <laughs> Good. Um, I think your style just evolved organically. And I don't know if it's the case with the other artists. Their work looks incredible and so kind of natural. I think it just happens organically. Um, you just naturally, you just naturally develop a language and a way of communicating. And what is, how would you describe your artistic style, David? What's your, oh, you, you, uh, how do you describe it? <clears throat> I guess it's it's very detailed. I'd say it's it's traditional in a way. Um, it's also very quirky. Um, yeah, very quirky, traditional sort of. I'm doing things from unusual perspectives. I can do a lot of work from my head. For example, the picture behind me, Las Vegas. I went there a few times. <laughs> That's good fun there. I can tell you, and um, I really enjoyed it. And then the idea of then coming back when we lived in Newport Beach and doing a big painting of Las Vegas. Could do a lot of it out of my head. God knows, and there's strips an incredible place to go. And, but that, yeah, so my work is, yeah, quirky, traditional. That, that's how I describe it. And has it changed over time? Yes, yeah, I think it's changed quite a lot. I do a lot more work now about the sort of the political situation, which is somewhat tricky <laughs> over here. And also when I lived in, um, uh, not so much in America, but certainly over here, and also more sort of articulating the struggles of autism, but now it's like understanding that the rest of the world is struggling within, you know, as well as my own struggle in adapting the world. And I think I visualize color a lot more now. My work was very monochrome for, for, for a long time. And as I've got older, I've started to develop a lot more work with color. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Sheila, would you like to share on that? Okay, well, my work has changed over the years. I think I described it, but I found I really like organic shapes. So I'm inspired by nature. And when I had an artist residency in Spain, I took a week in Barcelona to see Gaudi's architecture. And I found that so fascinating and i i'm working now with um with paper and making three dimensional objects that's great and you enjoy working in the paper medium do you actually make your own paper i have made paper but I found that you can buy very good um, handmade paper. And so I've taken advantage of them. Uh, people have given me paper also. Thank you so much. 
And Ronaldo, would you like to share on your artistic style and how it's evolved? Oh, my style is contemporary, made up of my own characters. To me, it is modern, fresh, and dope. And dope, you said? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and has it changed over time? Like when you, from when you started earlier, maybe a few years ago, how's, how has it evolved? Great. Great. Got a, got a, had got a more characters. Wonderful. Well, yes, it's all fun to see all the fascinating characters in your pieces. And now I'll give an opportunity to Jeremy to share on his artistic style and how that has evolved. Style is intuitive, abstract expressionism. I did not know how to express the lines and forms that I imagined. But I found a teacher who taught me how I could use painter's tape and layers of color to create the shapes I imagined. Frankly, my style has changed some over the years. I add more layers, but I use the same tools. Thank you, Jeremy. So my next question for all of you is, what do you love most about being an artist? Ronaldo. It brings me joy and it, it inspires me to be grateful. I also like the fact that my art makes people happy and I love painting. That's wonderful, Ronaldo. Anyone else about what you love about being an artist? David Downs. Well, it's, it's, it's cathartic. It's, it's what we're like Ronaldo is saying. It's, it's just an incredible thing to do, to make other people happy, you know, and, and to make myself happy doing, doing the work that I do. And as I've got older, I've, I've realized and appreciate that more and more. Wonderful. Thank you, David. Anyone else on that question about what you love most about being an artist? Sheila. Well, I think art was my road to freedom and it, it gave me a way to express myself and to communicate more with other people and give them joy. Thank you. And Jeremy. that I create beautiful objects that bring happiness to others. Wonderful. Well, it seems like you all have a common theme of enjoying bringing joy to others, which is wonderful. So my next question is, what are some of the challenges that you've had to overcome to get to where you are today? And what are your ongoing challenges? David. I think the challenge is, is life, isn't it? You can't just be an artist and paint and draw all the time because you've got the actual challenges of existence and life. And, you know, as I said, on executive function, you know, relationships and, and family. And and so there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of challenges. Indeed. Anyone else on your challenges? Jeremy. My greatest challenge currently is finding support staff to help me in the art studio. My motor challenges do not prevent me from painting, but do prevent me from doing the setup involved in painting. I need help with some of the physical aspects of moving the canvases and opening the paints. Since the COVID pandemic, it has been really hard to find and hire someone to support me in the art studio. Thank you, Jeremy. And Sheila? Well, I think my main 
challenge was that I didn't have any education, any degrees in art, and I really had to learn it on my own. But I was fortunate. I had the strengths of Asperger's, and I had the ability to absorb information and to be an independent learner, I was very motivated because this is what I wanted to do. So I'm happy that I accomplished it. Thank you, Sheila. And Ronaldo, do you have something to add on challenges? Well, this is the challenge for me. Speaking to you right now, Ms. Daniels, but I'm getting better at it. What makes me comfortable is showing my artwork or visiting a gallery. Fantastic. Well, we hope to make you comfortable here and everyone is really enjoying hearing from all four of you about your art and also looking at your backgrounds and seeing your art displayed. So my next question is, who has inspired you and supported you on your journey? David. I, I, I hope you don't mind me starting, but uh, well, incredible the amount of people that have been supportive and inspiring to me. But first of all, my mother, I think was the first person, you know, sadly no longer, no longer with us. She noticed my talent long before anyone else did and was a constant support. And my, my older sister and the late Sheila Payne, a lot of people, and also my agent Sally, who's also a very good friend of mine, and my other half, Rachel. And you know, these people are so important because it's it's also about understanding. These people understand me, my friends and family understand me, understand you know, my quirks and my oddities and you know, difficult sometimes and obsessive. And they've been really amazing. It's very That's important that I, I feel, and I'm with Ronaldo on this, by the way. It's incredible what you just said. That's amazing. It's it's really good, inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And David, what about your children and and their view of the work that you do in art? What what my my children? Yes. Uh, Tanya's two and a half. So um, yes, I think she's 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 more and more interested in what I'm doing and um, comes into the into the gallery quite often and. And started to painting and drawing, and it, it's 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 all the time she's changing and developing and and seeing what I'm doing, and it, it's it's wonderful. Oh, that's great. Anyone else want to talk about who's um, inspired and supported you, Jeremy? Um, you can become frankly encouraging parents the right teachers and lots of practice is how a person can become a successful artist work on your art as often as you can learn what you can you might be a person who has difficulty communicating but as an artist your art can speak for you Thank you, Jeremy. Anyone else on your supports and inspirations? Sheila. Well, um, early in my career, I found a mentor. And this was very important to me because she gave me the courage to go forward with this. And as far as my family, um, my son had, he had um, attention deficit disorder, but not, not autism at all. And now he has a very successful career. And he, as a child, he went to many galleries and museums and developed a, 
a life a certain artist that he enjoyed. And he enc always encourages me to do more with the art. Wonderful, thank you. Anyone else on this? Ronaldo? My mom has inspired me and supported me in being the best that I can be. Outstanding. Thank you. So my next question for you all is, what would you like to do in life with your art and in the future? Or what would you, what would you like to do in your life and also with your art in the future? What are your hopes and aspirations? Ronaldo. I would like my art in the Modern Museum of Art and maybe in the future have my characters, which I called the Art B Bunch in my own cartoon. Oh, exciting. Anyone else about your aspirations, David? I think to continue as I am, obviously, to carry on doing the work I'm doing, but to reach out to people. So my work isn't just, you know, got, you know, a, a language and a vision and to, and to keep going. And like Ronaldo, to get more work more, you know, in public places and galleries and all that kind of thing, but also to reach out to people. So some of my work's about my journey, but how, you know, without being egocentric, um, being an inspiration, this is my journey, this is what it was like for me, how is it for other people? That's, that's what I think. Wonderful. Anyone else on what you would like to do in the future, with in both in your personal life and, and in your art? Sheila? Well, I want to continue making art, and I hope that my art will live on after I'm gone. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you. And did Jeremy have anything to add on this question? No? Oh, the set. I should say the, the whole point of hoping to have more supports to do his art. Okay. Um, and just to continue to be able to do his art. Absolutely. So now I'd, I'd like to ask you each, what advice would you have for young autistic artists who may be watching this program and inspired and wanting to follow in your footsteps or create their own footsteps into a future with art? Ronaldo. Don't give up your dreams. You never know what it's going to happen in the future. This is true. That sounds like sound advice. Any other advice you would have for young autistic artists? David? Yes, it's the same, just to, to carry on and to, and to paint and draw and basically do what's around you, the world around you, and, and to, you know, to, to develop that. You know, to, to carry, you know, to carry on in that. It's a means of expression. Any other tips for young artists? Well, I think to draw on your strengths and take advantage of them. And is there anything kind of following on that question that you feel has helped you develop more confidence in your art to be able to share it um, and to be able to continue creating that young people might benefit from knowing?
it's all right. I will move on to another question. So what would you like the world to know about autistic people? Oh, Jeremy. Are you ready, Jeremy? An autistic person is non-speaking. It does not mean they are non-thinking. Everyone should be taught an appropriate way to communicate and be given the supports they need in order to do so. After all, communication is a basic human right. Children and people like me and their families should not have to fight for these supports in school as they currently do. Thank you, Jeremy. What else do you all want to share with the world that they should know about autistic people? Ronaldo. Uh, I want the world to know that the autistic people are being true to themselves. And that we have something special to offer to the world. We certainly do. And you in particular, and all of you and all autistic people. Um, Sheila. Um, well, that well, people who are autistic have strengths as well as challenges. Thank you, Sheila. Any, oh, David, do you have a comment too? Yeah, I concur with what the other artists are saying that, you know, that we're di we have our challenges, but we're different. But you also have those, you know, the incredible unique strengths. And, you know, the, you know, the world waits for no one, the society obviously is, but it is a case of, of, of fitting in, you know, but also people understanding that we do have these, in these incredible unusual abilities. Uh, and and there's the, you're almost like a spectrum within a spectrum. There's so many different, you know, so many different types of autistic people. You know, it's such an incredible range of of difference between one autistic person to another um, autistic person. If that makes sense. Yes, thank you. So, and my last question for this section of the program is: Over the last twenty years, there's been so much progress in the understanding of autism. How do you hope that our understanding will have, will have advanced 20 years from now? And how would you like to see things change? David. Society, but for society, as I said, to embrace the, you know, the strengths of people with neurodiversity. You know, we do have these incredible capacities to be very obsessive about certain things focus on certain things that you know are going to be challenging hugely challenging in the future for example climate change is one where we've got to find ways for people like me with different uh, abilities to embrace you know embrace people like us in the future and i think it's it's, it's happening now which is amazing uh, that you know it's already happening thank you david jeremy And truly the idea that I can kindly paint is really only happening because I was given a way to communicate and I could tell people what I was seeing and feeling in my dreams. I hope that in over the next 20 years, people don't have to uh, go on without having a way to communicate to others what their skills are. Thank you, Jeremy. Ronaldo? I, I think that 20 years from now, there will be a better understanding of autism and that autistic people will be more included. That is my hope. Thank you, Ronaldo. And Sheila, do you have a last word on this about what you hope will happen in the future? Yeah. Just that things will be better and, pe and, and people with autism 
not discriminated against and people be more willing to acknowledge that they're on the autism spectrum. Wonderful. Well, thank you um, for sharing about with these um, these different questions I've asked you. Uh, we appreciated hearing from you on those. And now we're going to take some time to do Q&A with the online audience, not exactly a um, live uh, Q&A, but we have the questions that you've all been sending in over time. And I'd like to introduce Stephen Isaacson from my office, who is going to share some of the questions that we've received from our listening audience. And we would love to share those with all of you. Um, so Stephen. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Stephen. I work with Susan and the team um, at the office of ORC. Um, I would like to start with a question that we got from the community, and this is open to everybody. Uh, we wanted to know, um, do you listen to music when you work? And if so, what kind of music? Very much at the moment, Depeche Mode and its new album. Um, I listen to a lot of like uh, rock music, um, indie music. Sort of, it's been a massive inspiration. It helps a lot. Ronaldo, I saw your hand up. All types, all types of music. Absolutely. Uh, Sheila or Jeremy? Would you like to answer? Well, I like classical music, and so I try to turn that on. Yeah, classical uh, helps the brain, definitely. OK, thank you for those answers. Um, another question from the audience um, is about learning style and whether um, your type of learning style, whether it's verbal, visual, or kinesthetic, which means um, learning by doing, um, does your learning style impact your art? And if so, how? Ronaldo. Visual. Yeah, you're a visual learner. Yeah. And uh, how does that impact your art? Mm. Painting, drawing. Absolutely. David, did you have your hand up? Yeah, the same. Uh, visual and, and also emotion, you know, how things, you know, around us an impact on me, um, whether it's a political thing or a weather or anything like that. So it's, it's, a, it's a visual response, but also a response to a situation or an event, emotion, which is important to me. Thank you for those answers. Um, can you talk about um, how art has provided opportunities for you uh, that you wouldn't have had otherwise? And Stephen, this it looks like Jeremy to... had a, a response on your previous question, if you want to jump back to him. Okay, Jeremy, go ahead. My learning style is auditory, and that is why music is so important to me. And I love all kinds of music that tells a story. It's wonderful. Great. Thank you. Thank and you, Stephen, I have one other item just um, I was asked to give a reminder to everyone that you can go in NIH video cast and there's a link for the Q&A and um, to the live feedback link and you can use that to submit questions. So, and then please carry on, Stephen. Yes, thank you for that reminder. Uh, a question we had from the audience was, um, how did art provide opportunities in life that you wouldn't have had otherwise? David, it's providing opportunities. When I was young, it's about the only thing I could do as a as a as a kid. It's to, it, you know, it stood me apart from from everyone else. So it's a way of it's a way of reaching out. It's you know, for a very long time, 
before I could communicate properly or anything else. It was it was all I could do, and it was unusual. So it gave me an identity, if you like. Otherwise, I was just a very odd, autistic little boy. But suddenly go, oh, it's David Downs. Oh, but he does very strange drawings of churches and, and road junctions and flyovers and stuff like that. Thank you, David. Um, Sheila, we had a question for you from the audience. Um, can you talk more about how you incorporate poetry into your uh, into your art? Well, I I was introduced to poetry after I started doing art, and I find that um, some of my poetry is is ekphrastic, which means that it's based on an artwork. And now I've been um, making pieces and for many of the pieces now, I have a poem that goes with the piece. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Sheila. Um, we had a question for Jeremy from the audience. Um, what are you currently working on? Truly, I am working on a few pieces about the typing community. That in INS inspires me, and I'm a KLS also. Do you know? So he says, I'm doing a few pieces that are inspired by the typing community that I'm a part of, and I'm also doing a few pieces. That are, you're doing great, Jeremy. Commissioned. T to H to honor people that I K N O that I know people that I know. A few painting and a few paintings to honor people that I know. That's wonderful. Thank you, Jeremy, for that response. We had another question for Ronaldo. The question is, how old uh, were you when you realized you could create art? I was three years old. Thank you, Ronaldo. Uh, we got another uh, question from the audience. Um, when did you feel comfortable sharing your diagnosis with others? And this question is for everybody. Uh, how did you decide that you wanted others to know that you're autistic?
It's like David had a response. <clears throat> I couldn't wait to tell people that I was autistic uh, because it was it was almost like I was I was what you know the label gave an explanation for my very odd and eccentric behaviour for all the years subsequent to it. I think it was it was it, yeah that's how I see it. Thank you, David. Anyone else uh, would like to respond? Oh, Sheila. Well, when I was diagnosed, I no longer had a, a regular job. And so I shared it freely, but I, I meet a lot of people now who are employed and they will not share it because they're afraid it might influence um, other people to think badly of them that they're not competent. And I think that's really sad. Yeah, thank you, Sheila, for that response. Jeremy, do you have a response you'd like to share? No, okay. Um, we did have a question for Jeremy uh, from the audience. Um, can you talk more about what it's like to live with synesthesia? Do you want me to take the time to answer that and they can come back to you? Yes. Uh, so he can answer that, but meanwhile, because it'll take a while for him to type it out. If you want to go to another question, then come back to him. Does that okay. work? Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a question for everybody. Um, what do you do when you feel like you need some creative inspiration? Sheila. I go for a walk. I find that um, walking is a very important part of my life. It's not only good exercise, but it puts you into a good emotional, mental frame, and it stirs my creativity. And yeah, walking, absolutely. The walking outdoors is a very important part of my life. Yes, being outside is, is very nice. Thanks so much, Sheila. Um, we had a question from the audience for, uh, for Ronaldo. Can you talk about um, where your characters come from? My mind. Awesome. Um, is there any sort of inspiration you get, or do they um, do they just pop up? Just pop up. That's wonderful. Uh, if you weren't an artist, uh, can you tell us what you'd do instead? I'm an artist. So. That's awesome. Yeah. There's no other career but, but art, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, let's see. So this is a question for everybody. Um, what is one piece of art that you're proud of and why? David? I think uh, probably for me it has to be the Savoy, the the, the painting I did for the Savoy Hotel. Uh, my agent Sally organised it well many years ago in 2012. That recorded the the raw pageant, the um, the golden I think it's a golden jubilee, or even you know diamond jubilee. Um, that's probably the most seminal piece that I've done. The piece that's, that I'm most proud of that you know puts together all the, the all the years previous years of experience and. And the way that I work. Yeah, thanks so much, David. Um, there was a question from the audience. Um, how do you manage to see things um, such as city uh, cityscapes um, from a zoomed out perspective? Um, 
Well, a lot of people think I've got a drone, but I actually haven't. I, I do a lot of it from my head. Um, it's quite difficult, but I can just imagine how things are from above and always have done ever since I was a kid. In fact, a lot of my art when I was very little, I didn't really understand actually how I was doing it. You know, I'd be in trees or on top of church towers or tower blocks, so that kind of thing, metropolises. But then my work went more conventional for a while, but in the last, well, I guess, 20 years, I've really enjoyed doing sort of, um, well, yeah, they would be called drone scapes, I guess, now, that uh, the capacity to draw from above. It's good to have drone shots as well as reference to get things exactly right. But with seascapes, I can just paint the seascapes out of my head. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that. Um, you said that you could draw before you could talk. Uh, talk. Um, is there a location that you would that you've been wanting to draw or paint that you haven't yet? I mean, um, I suppose there's so many locations that I would love to go visit and travel to and, and, and paint and draw. But what for a long time was India. I got quite a lot of interest a few years ago and wanted to go to India, places that I've never been to before. But I guess the place I'd like to go back to is New York. I absolutely love New York. Um, all my childhood obsessions of tower blocks and, and metropolises and, you know, just coming back. So many, many great places. Also Antarctica as well. Absolutely. Well, we'll uh, be happy to have you in the States anytime. Um, sure, come. <laughs> uh, just wanted to check back with Jeremy to see if he had an answer prepared. Written in the past, which I now finally found on his iPad. And he says that... Um, I give people hope by showing them their inner beauty and spiritual essence. As a visionary artist and a synesthete, I see motion as color and the energy vibrations around people and all living creatures. Music and voices also elicit color. And the colors usually mean the same emotions, but different hues can mean different things about that emotion on that person. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, we had another question from the audience. Um, this is for everybody. Uh, what advice can you offer children who are autistic and struggling to understand um, how they're different from their peers? And uh, the secondary question is, what, what advice do you might have for their parents? So advice for autistic children and then also maybe their parents as well. David? Acceptance, I think, is a vital one, but also patience. A lot of patience and a lot of acceptance and understanding that certain things that will seem very easy to a lot of people will be very, very difficult for young children, you know, and also sensory experiences of sound and light. Is patience, I think, is, is, is vital. Thank you, David. Anyone else have advice for autistic children or their parents? Ronaldo. Just be who you are. Thank you. Uh, Sheila or Jeremy? Well, just live your life with that, with that truly. Absolutely. Thank you, Sheila. And Jeremy, did you have a response? It's kind of changing. Go ahead, finish. Go ahead, you're almost done with that letter, that word anyway. Go ahead, focus.
Go ahead. You're doing great, Jeremy. Go ahead. When you're done, just hit the period. Let's hit the period when you're done. All right, that's good. I have my little, uh, sorry, did you write it down? Oh, sorry, part of it. He said, uh, truly tell your children every day you love them because sometimes they hear bad things during the day directed to them. Thank you very much, Jeremy, and for everyone uh, for engaging in that discussion with the audience. Uh, now I'll turn it back over to Dr. Daniels. Thank you so much, Stephen. And so now we'll just take a few moments to thank everyone again for being here. Thank you to all of our amazing speakers for joining us today for this really special event. I know that everyone in the audience was truly inspired by your work and your words that you shared today. And thank you to our viewing audience for spending this time with us to get to know these artists and learn about their work. I also would like to give special thanks to the incredible team we have at the Office of Autism Research Coordination, and their photos are up on the screen, as well as our contractor, Rosalie and Associates, and NIH Videocast that made this broadcast possible. And if you'd like to learn more about the featured artists and their works, and to view their beautiful virtual art galleries that we've placed on our website, you can visit our website um, at iacc.hhs.gov. And on the event webpage, you'll also find links to each artist's own webpage and other resources about them. And you also may be interested in finding out more about Autism Awareness Month activities around the federal government and around the community. And you can see on the homepage there, there's a little box for Autism Awareness Month. So you can click there and find all kinds of press releases and information about Autism Awareness Month around the entire world. And um, as well as the video from this event that will be posted sometime next week. And you'll be able to share that with your friends and family and your networks if you'd like to share. So thank you again for being with us. And Thank you again to our artists. It was a really special time to talk with you and to see your beautiful art. And I know that we all truly enjoyed it. So I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Goodbye. You too. <laughs>